Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, here we are having a webinar on the topic on smart city solutions for Ukrainian Renaissance. And today with us, we have Kural Mamedov and uh, Steve Russo. Uh, before we start, um, I want to mention that this is the partnership webinar of Oku Business School and uh, Artologic. Uh, I will tell you a few words about Uku Business School if you don't know us and you for, for the first time you're with us and later Tural will take on and uh, tell a few words about uh, Artologic as well. So Uku Business School, it's not just, uh, it just, not just business school, it's the school with European values and approaches which has been developing an open and responsible business community in Ukraine for more than 14 years for now. Uh, we have more than five uh, master degree programs, 25 executive education programs, online courses, and so much more. Uh, a few, uh, before we start, I want to tell you a few words about how our meeting will go on today. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, regarding the topic, uh, please don't hesitate and, and write it down in the chat box. And during the webinar or in the end of the webinar, we will uh, try to give the answer uh, on that question. And also we will record this uh, meeting. And uh, in case there are alarm sirens on, if you are in Ukraine, uh, you can follow to the bomb shelter and uh, later you will be able to uh, watch the full webinar on our YouTube channel. But in, I hope there will be no sirens and we will have our meeting go on uh, without interruption. So before we start, I want to introduce to you our speakers. And the first of all, of course, is Steven Brusso, who is VP Product Management at uh, Lineal S2 Company. He is also a uh, he's also the UKU Business School Lecturer on the program, on Master Program of Technology Management. And uh, of course, I will introduce you to Ralma Medov, who is the CEO at Artologic and who is also uh, alumni on this program, uh, of a Master Program on Technology Management at UKU Business School. And by the way, if you want to know more about this program, uh, you can do that on our website because uh, you can still join us for this master program. I will send in chat box the, um, the link to our website and Raul, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Elena, for the introduction. So maybe I will reintroduce myself again. So my name is Raul, I'm the co-founder of Portologic, and today I'm going to be uh, the uh, moderator of this event. So basically, uh, my mission here would be uh, to make sure that we answer all of your questions and this presentation goes uh, as conveniently as possible for everyone. I also have a couple of mind questions uh, that I might ask uh, uh, during the, the presentation. We have no other questions, but anyways. Um, and yeah, so uh, the presentation itself, I'm not sure we, um, if you mentioned that, uh, will take around 30 minutes and then we will have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, at this webinar and uh, we'll be able to answer all the questions. And as um, as Olena already mentioned, uh, we can uh, you can ask all questions in the comment section so we can answer them right away. We will at least we'll try to do our best to answer, answer them right away. Uh, so feel free to do that. I'm monitoring that, all questions. And uh, yeah, today's topic uh, is is, is a vision uh, into a bright future, the moment that everyone thinks about in Ukraine at least, uh, the moment when uh, Ukraine wins and we finish one job with uh, getting Russians out of the country and we have to get to the next uh, task and to rebuild our cities. Some cities we have to build anew, some we have to rebuild. And uh, today we will talk, today we will talk about smart city solutions and the way we can transform our cities to be smarter than they were previously. And uh, we will try to look into this situation that we have as an opportunity to build a new future uh, for our cities. And Steven Rousseau will tell us more. Uh, as a person that was exposed to smart city solutions for many years at IBM, and uh, Steven prepared the presentation 
to get us on board with this topic and also answer all your questions. Steven. Okay. Thank you. Let me uh, share the presentation and then I will uh, also give a additional introduction, but just one moment, please. Okay. Is that displaying? Yes. Okay. okay, so thank you for uh, for inviting me. As you heard uh, before, I have had the great opportunity to be in Ukraine and to uh, teach and lecture at uh, UKU, uh, at Ukrainian Catholic University and the Lviv Business School and uh, taught some classes there uh, and continue to, to do so uh, into the, this fall as well. Uh, so the idea, so I have about 33 years of experience of working in technology. Uh, my core background is engineering, uh, but working on how we take uh, sophisticated and new and upcoming entrepreneurial technology and move it into uh, real solutions that help uh, provide value uh, for uh, cities, for various businesses uh, and so forth. Uh, and I'll talk to you a bit about how and some of the techniques on doing that and what needs to be considered. This is a very broad topic and can take us uh, many hours to go through uh, even uh, different segments of them. So, so the presentation is at a bit of a high level. I'm happy to drill into uh, details and experiences uh, as needed and also to, to talk about this in subsequent uh, sessions as well. Uh, as, as we all well know, uh, you've got uh, major challenges of being able to uh, rebuild cities that uh, uh, are in need of complete uh, restructuring and rebuilding and to uh, modernize some uh, of the other cities. Uh, in my experience uh, working with uh, Ukraine and being in Ukraine over the last uh, seven or eight years, uh, I have to say I've been extremely impressed and continue to be uh, on uh, the innovation, the understanding of uh, what the needs are and constantly looking how to learn and grow and be able to use best practices and experiences from different parts of the world and to be able to, to drive uh, your businesses. Uh, I spent uh, almost 30, actually 34 years in IBM, uh, working in a number of areas from uh, our research Watson, Watson Center to our services group, to creating software products, to product management. Uh, and in the, uh, in the last uh, probably 10 years of my time there was working in what we call smarter cities, uh, safer planet, uh, being able to work with and provide safety and security solutions, as well as uh, operational solutions uh, for cities, for law enforcement, uh, for um, intelligence and so forth. As a matter of fact, some of our intelligence uh, solutions uh, that we worked with, I have worked in collaboration with UKU to, to help in the current uh, situation. I can't go into details about that, but it is uh, being used uh, today as well. So I'll try to touch on those various areas. Uh, as much as I can. I, I did decide about a year ago to retire from IBM and join a, another company, also a global company called uh, Carrier Global, uh, which was part of United Technologies Group, uh, which was a large technologies uh, organization that broke into smaller pieces. Uh, and within that, there is an entity called the Linnell S2 responsible for safety and security. So I'm uh, responsible for uh, a large piece of the portfolio around safety and security, but Carrier uh, also is uh, world-class in creating uh, intelligent uh, buildings and environmentally uh, sustainable uh, structures uh, and infrastructure uh, for cities, which I'll go into some of that, that detail as well. So with that, let me uh, proceed. Uh, first of all, an idea we've also heard, and I was involved in early stages of what was the IoT or what is the IoT, the Internet of Things. Uh, initially, I have to say it was this uh, very uh, rough concept of all devices being connected. But what did that mean? What does it actually do? How uh, can IoT be used in an effective way uh, to provide value to uh, to citizens, to corporations, uh, and so forth? A lot of maturity has come come with that. Uh, and uh, the initial part of IoT is being able to connect devices, to be able to gather information together, and then moving into uh, how do you become smarter? Uh, right? If you are in, in a very simple example, if you're 
uh, on the road at a traffic light and the light is is red and you are stopped but there is no other traffic uh, around you wait until the light turns uh, green um can those uh, traffic signals be more intelligent to understand traffic patterns at various times of the day to be able to uh, make decisions on the timing to change that to help uh, move the flow of of traffic traffic is a huge problem around the world uh, in in every one of the major cities uh, and being able to even have small improvements in that can have very dramatic and drastic improvement effects on the overall uh, economy. So moving from connected to smart, moving from smart to intelligent, what's the difference between smart and intelligent? Uh, smart is, is taking that next level. Uh, and as I, I use that example of being uh, coming a little smarter in what you're doing, but now being intelligent is using all of the experiences uh, that you may have had from the past using historical data to now start to be more prescriptive and understand what uh, the needs are and uh, and work more as the human mind. All of us work based on the collective set of experiences that we may have and then use that data for us to uh, to become more intelligent and to grow on that. Uh, so that uh, innovation, new ideas, new creation builds off of innovation and ideas and creation in the past. In the same way, systems can do that, which brings us to the next level of being uh, cognitive or moving to that cognitive of truly starting to now decipher uh, as I uh, have uh, experienced in, and I'm sure all of you have, in the lower grades of your educational system. Uh, you're very often taught the very basics. You uh, remember things or memorize. And then uh, when you're asked the question, you recall that from memory and give the answer. To now take ideas and concepts and apply them to uh, how it can be used in a, a truly intelligent way and to be able to modify and adjust that based on experiences and, and situations. Understanding, for example, anomalies, understanding where threats may be in planning stages. Uh, one of the areas that I've concentrated heavily on is counterterrorism. Uh, and in, in, in the area of counterterrorism is trying to be able to understand where uh, acts of terrorism are in the planning stages uh, before they become something that that now I need to uh, I need to deal with uh, because they they were successful in their their terrorist uh, events. So being able to to be uh, better understanding in the case that you are in now is to to understand the enemy and what their plans are, and then how do you react and circumvent those moves you into that cognitive level. So in the area of smarter cities and smarter buildings uh, and smarter infrastructure overall, moving from being just connected and gathering information to becoming smarter, to becoming intelligent, to truly being cognitive is the uh, is the progression. And there is advantages at each stage uh, of that, that type of progression. If we look at the different factors that we need to take into account, and there's many more, this is just a small example, uh, and creating and, and more and more we hear about the need to be sustainable, to be uh, truly energy and efficient, to have lower carbon uh, footprint and to be able to operate in a very effective uh, way, in a very efficient way. But I, I summarize this at a high level into two sides. One, human factors, things that we need to deal with from criminal activity uh, uh, losses to what you're, you're seeing now of attacks and terrorism uh, and being able to have overall security to, to health uh, situations as we've all just coming out of the uh, the, the pandemic uh, with uh, COVID and other biohazards and so forth, being able to ensure the integrity and the freshness of food to infrastructure. Uh, I focused uh, for quite some time on infrastructure projects and found that worldwide, all of the infrastructure that we use on a daily basis without any of the situations of, of war and attacks of just from normal deterioration and wear, that about 60% of the infrastructure uh, that we use, bridges, tunnels, roadways, are beyond their design lifespan. 
Uh, and many of them uh, are at the stage of uh, potential natural collapse from just aging and lack of maintenance and, and so forth. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Two, environmental factors of natural disasters, weather situations, power failures, uh, lack of, of resources, of uh, fresh water, the ability to remove wastewater, uh, all of, the, of those things. So all of these things need to be taken into account in the creation of uh, large uh, city environments, and then being able to move it into how can you be more uh, sustainable and also resilient uh, that we're able to to deal with these uh, these various effects or challenges that are happening on a regular basis, both human and environmental, uh, and and ensure the the sustainability uh, of cities uh, going uh, forward. Uh, and in some cases. Right. We are rebuilding and modernizing existing infrastructures, uh, I should say modernizing, and the other is, is truly rebuilding uh, where it, uh, so sadly, uh, as, as we see the destruction of, of infrastructure of how and what will be rebuilt and what are the opportunities to now do things in a way that take advantage of modern technology, uh, modern thought knowledge and to build on that collective understanding of uh, how uh, modernized cities uh, are are operating today. John, I will ask that question. So Please. from your experience, is it easier to build smart city from scratch or to rebuild? So, you, I mean, to make a gradual, uh, to make gradual steps towards a smart city. So do you think it's an opportunity that we have that, so that it will be easier for us to achieve that goal or it's more difficult? Yeah, there are a few ways to look at it. So from a pure technology and smarter city perspective, it is an opportunity to, to work off and rebuild a, a smart city from scratch. Um, but it's easy to say that from a technology perspective, obviously the, uh, the, the human loss, the collateral loss, the, the sheer cost of, of rebuilding uh, and, and especially eliminating uh, the, uh, the waste takes time, but it allows you the opportunity to look at things in a new way uh, where uh, unfortunately some of the cities are not operating as they would. So you can build them from the ground up in the same way of of trying to take a very old IT system 30, 40 years and bring it into new technology. It's sometimes harder than rebuilding it from, uh, from scratch with new uh, technology, new building techniques, um, uh, and, and being able to, to build from the ground up. Uh, so it is a balance. I've had the opportunity to work in uh, large cities such as New York, London, Zurich, uh, in places that are uh, are well established and modernizing technology there, uh, as well as areas uh, such as South America in Peru, where there there are some areas where there is almost nothing uh, and very high crime, um, uh, difficult to uh, to operate because of lack of uh, certain resources, uh, and building cities up uh, from from there. Some of what you see in the Middle East in in uh, uh, parts of or, or all of the United uh, Arab Emirates and how they have built cities uh, from the base. Uh, in some ways, they, they're much further uh, ahead of large established cities like Rome, London, New York, uh, but they did not have to recover from devastation and uh, and destruction. So if you if you get beyond the the level of destruction to the rebuilding stage. Yes, you can then take into account uh, new and modernized uh, capabilities and technologies for uh, both sustainability, efficiency, uh, and and uh, the uh, in intelligence behind it. Uh, thank you, Simon. And we also have one question related to the previous slide. Uh, and the question is uh, that uh, Alexei noticed that the climate change was not among the challenges cities Phase. And the question is, what do you, Stephen, understand under sustainability and resilience of city? Yeah. So uh, I don't have it listed as climate change directly, but what we mean by natural disasters is, in fact, um, due to, to climate change uh, and, and other uh, various disasters that have been occurring uh, throughout history that, that are not predictable. 
so so climate change has clearly caused more of these sort of things to uh, to start happening uh, to us. But how do we then deal with it, and how do we become more resilient uh, in both the uh, creation of infrastructure that's able? Uh, clearly, there are techniques uh, that can allow for infrastructure to be created that can withstand earthquakes, be able to be uh, flood resilient uh, with the, the the movement, the more uh, adequate movement of uh, of water uh, and so forth. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, being able to use techniques that allow people to continue their uh, their lives. Uh, I'll give an example. I worked uh, with uh, what we call in the United States, each one of the states has an adjunct general, which is responsible for various types of natural disasters and being able to help people uh, in these difficult times. Uh, and uh, one thing you can, uh, of course, uh, ensure that you have people have food and water and being able to, to move around uh, more easily, but how do you do that and prepare for it before the disaster happens? Unfortunately, we find out in many cases because of politics, uh, I've found and uh, that in many countries around the world that politicians, their sole objective is to be reelected. Uh, and uh, sometimes they're they're not looking at uh, preparing adequately for natural disasters or climate change because it hasn't happened in a certain number of years and the likelihood of it happening before they need to be reelected uh, may be low and they're not investing properly. Now we do see there is more of an awareness. Uh, you also uh, have experienced firsthand uh, threats from uh, other factors of, of uh, neighbors attacking and so forth. Uh, so that in combination with natural disasters and being uh, more prepared uh, and being able to, to create resilience and backup systems for, for all cities need power. They need to be able to bring in food and resources, and they need to be able to bring in water and remove wastewater. Those are the, the main uh, pieces of operation that are, are required. Of course, safety and security and all of these other things uh, are on top of that. But those are the, the uh, basic components that allow uh, human life to be sustained uh, in those environments. And how do we ensure that we have the, the proper uh, mechanisms for uh, flow uh, of uh, water, to flow of food and resources that are needed, and to allow people uh, their their movement uh, uh, for their basic needs, and then allowing business and commerce to happen on top of that. Uh, some of what I believe uh, Ukraine, in your experiences, can also bring to the world is uh, clearly uh, the world watches with amazement on how you have been able to sustain uh, the, um, the country so far is to be able to eventually, when we get to the point of rebuilding, is to use those learning experiences uh, and be able to apply that into resilient uh, systems. So uh, I see that as, as an advantage to be able to take that learning and be able to, uh, to grow it. Uh, I've seen that and we've used similar experiences from uh, areas in the Middle East. Uh, some of the challenges, for example, Israel has faced uh, and how they have been able to, uh, to overcome uh, the various um, attacks uh, as well as the need for getting in natural resources, uh, giving that many of their, their neighbors around them uh, do not have friendly uh, relationships. Uh, with them. So uh, so a lot of learning from that, a, a lot of, of learning can be gathered also from Ukraine and being able to use that history to become more resilient uh, and more sustainable over time. Mm -hmm. Stephen, and, and there's another additional question uh, to the same topic. So uh, when you're talking about a smart city, does it mean that uh, they're all by design, uh, they're designed towards adapting to those threats or uh, the priorities also over the mitigation of those issues. For example, if you have the issue with uh, weather, uh, earthquakes, floods, etc. So maybe we can design uh, cities in a way that can mitigate those issues rather than make a response. Yeah, the needs are very different depending on where we are in different parts of the world. Uh, one of the things that IBM did is we had a what we call the Smarter Cities Challenge, and every year 
30 cities were chosen uh, where we would do in-depth analysis for different areas uh, of, of concern. Uh, so for example, I did uh, one very detailed analysis in Peru, uh, and it was an area that had uh, problems with infrastructure, but also with public safety because of uh, drug activity, uh, and uh, and cartels in the area, public safety was a major challenge. In other areas, it becomes uh, in in parts of of India and Bangladesh, uh, very drastic and severe weather conditions. Uh, what I found in, in areas like Singapore, uh, Singapore amazingly, given that it is just on the equator, uh, large while they have major thunderstorms and so forth, uh, they do not have because a, a hurricane, typhoon. Uh, cannot uh, exist on the equator uh, because of, uh, of course, uh, uh, geospatial and, and physics uh, around uh, the, uh, the, the the turning of those systems. Uh, they don't have those type of weather conditions. So, but that what they do have is the need for commerce to be able to deal with shipping and large amounts of being able to uh, unload and reload. So the the challenges and needs. Four cities are different in different parts of the world. Another uh, project that I worked on very heavily in a little bit uh, uh, west of you in Katowice in Poland, in Katowice, which was a large coal mining and industrial area, has now become an IT hub of making that transition from a previous um, economy uh, based on natural resources to an economy now based on technology. So depending on the various areas, and I think what we will see in Ukraine is a different a difference, of course, in the, the East, the need to completely uh, rebuild certain cities to areas in the West, uh, such as Lviv, where some of the modernization to, uh, to base infrastructure and technology uh, is needed, but not necessarily uh, reestablishing the, uh, the, the physical infrastructure uh, repair. So depending on where the needs are, it's important to step back and, and understand what the main objectives are and the path forward. None of this gets done overnight from a monetary perspective, uh, from a... Um, just the time it takes to put these systems in place uh, to decide what the the key factors are and to be able to uh, to establish the objectives uh, clearly. By the way, I also mentioned it's important to elect proper officials that have that that vision on on how to do this, uh, which uh, that I've found to be critically important that uh, we have uh, leaders who have a good understanding of not only what's needed to uh, to build a, a city, uh, but also what the key priorities are to be able to grow commerce, to be able to create job opportunities uh, and and uh, and be able to uh, expand and revitalize uh, these locations. Thank you. Okay. Okay, continuing on. Uh, so as we look at uh, smarter cities, and this goes into more of, uh, what we were just talking about. There are many different domains that we may be uh, interested in. Connecting citizens and having the ability to have uh, a crowdsourcing of information. Uh, many of you may have used uh, what's called Waze or WASI, depending on what part of the world. Uh, and the interesting thing about that, and of course, it's a technology that's aged now, but being able to take data from uh, various uh, entities, those endpoint devices being uh, humans, uh, to be able to gauge and become smarter and change your course uh, depending on very current conditions. So connecting citizens together, allowing them not only to gain data, but also communicate data back to a, a central point. Public safety. It is difficult to have any sort of uh, uh, economy, as you well know, of not having uh, both public safety from criminal activity, but public safety from external uh, attacks and so forth, and the, the military aspect of that. So very large uh, area. Uh, environmental monitoring, uh, understanding environmental changes so that you can do something about them before something drastic happens. Water management and, and utilities, a, a serious issue around the world of being able to get fresh water in and wastewater out, uh, and then becoming more sustainable of uh, lighting and waste management to be able to do that more more effectively uh, and energy management moving to more sustainable uh, type energy and being able to uh, handle infrastructure 
in an energy efficient way. Uh, I'll mention an example. I had the opportunity to work on a, a monitoring project for infrastructure on uh, the what's called the Storbelt Bridge in uh, Denmark, which connects uh, two areas of Denmark. It's, uh, it was the largest suspension bridge in the world. Uh, it is now a few or slightly larger in China, uh, but it spans almost 21 kilometers. Uh, with the center suspension area of approximately a little less than three kilometers. Uh, so it's a massive structure. Uh, it's connected to remote areas of uh, Denmark. Uh, with the work that we've done with them, it was originally designed and opened about 15 years ago. <clears throat> uh, and it was estimated to have a life of approximately 100 years. Uh, with the work that we've done with them on monitoring and uh, putting sensors on this bridge and being very targeted about maintenance, uh, they have recently declared that uh, the lifespan of that bridge uh, is now doubled to over 200 years, uh, and hopefully we'll get it to be more. So uh, using IoT, using that data, and being able to uh, handle it in an effective way can also help increase the lifespan of uh, our, our infrastructure. So, uh, and we look at what's happening around us, uh, just in, in general, and these are worldwide, the explosion of data with all of the various devices that we have, <clears throat> both uh, cell phones, uh, with now more and more, we're seeing 5G uh, being uh, deployed widely in various parts of the world, which allow uh, uh, data to be communicated and uh, sensors to communicate more frequently that we were not able to do before. So this is an area where uh, having a new, for example, building the question that was asked earlier, uh, telecommunication system from scratch, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, which is now enabled for 5G, uh, allows us to have literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of sensors that can, can be communicating data. <clears throat> a statistic that was done of looking at the growth of data that says every year, the amount of data that exists globally that is created by human beings uh, is has um, incremented by 64 times what it was the year before uh, with a, a logarithmic and it, it's increasing as we as we go forward. So the amount of data is exploding uh, or has exploded and is even more. How do we use that in an effective way and move out information that may not be uh, required and moving to, uh, to data that is, is really essential? 80% uh, of that data is unstructured, coming from video, multimedia, sound, voice, uh, a number of things of using modern techniques to, uh, to be able to structure it in a way that it can be uh, used in an effective way. <clears throat> Uh, to be able to, to deal with change in a, a cyber uh, perspective, we, we're seeing now, too, that, uh, that wars, conflicts, uh, even uh, internal uh, economic wars are being fought on the cyber battlefield uh, greatly. And being able to, uh, to have a, a sustainable system that is resilient to attacks but also to be able to see where and how data may be leaking and used to your disadvantage. We see this very greatly in uh, intelligence uh, and in fraud and being able to uh, find uh, various acts in the planning stages. Uh, there are ways that, that we have to do this. Uh, I, can't, I can't give new examples, but let me give an older one. Uh, there was a terrorist attack that happened in Israel uh, a few years ago. Uh, and we were able to uh, scan and use some of our link analysis technology to look at the interrelationships between phone calls and uh, relationships of people from the person who was a suicide bomber uh, of over 15 million uh, phone calls and be able to connect those together and find who was the perpetrator of this crime in about 25 seconds. So this link analysis of looking, all right, who's associated with who, uh, these people live at this same address, uh, this person is a member of this uh, group, uh, they, the, the leader of that group, and moving back sometimes 10, 20, 30, 50 levels and being able to find who the perpetrator was or who was the planning force behind that crime and to be able to do that in less than a minute, which would take you know, years to do by by hand. So, uh, and some of that technology was actually 
used to be able to uh, find bin Laden uh, and, and where he was uh, by this, this link analysis. Uh, so these technologies are growing. Uh, a lot of the security capabilities that we have behind uh, the, the systems, uh, what I like to say, the most effective uh, level of security is the security that you don't see uh, and the the effect, the attacks and the uh, uh, that are in the planning stages that don't actually uh, become successful. Uh, there are many of those that, that are happening constantly. So having that data and being able to analyze that. So the need for, uh, in a career perspective of data scientists, of being able to have a perspective of uh, where data is coming from, how it can be used, the linkage between various uh, entities uh, will become critical and additional and new job opportunities will come out of this uh, as well to help in, in rebuilding uh, these cities. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, so you're talking about big data, and uh, as you mentioned, we collect a lot of data uh, nowadays. And uh, I will probably ask a stupid question. Uh, can a city be too smart in some specific cases? And what I mean here is there are two, two points, basically. First is ethics. Uh, we collect a lot of data about people, a lot of personal data. And uh, the question is, that in this case, how much is enough for a smart city? And uh, because we are not always know what, was, what, what happens with the data. And another issue is more related to Ukraine now is cybersecurity. So for example, if you implement the smart city in Denmark, probably they have, and they have a lot of infrastructure things to relay, relying on smart city solutions. Uh, they don't have a lot of cybersecurity threats, but for Ukraine, this will be a completely different story. And I have this question, can be there a country that is simply not ready uh, for deep smart solutions? Sometimes the country sell because of the mindset that we have internally here or because of neighbors that we have uh, near us. It, it, so I would say there's definitely a balance. So if we look at, and to use your example, so Denmark clearly uh, it, it modernized infrastructure. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's well organized. It does not have the threats that, that, that you have uh, and it, it doesn't have the, is the same level of need. Uh, but if we look at uh, taking a, the converse area of Israel uh, and, and what they do. Now, Israel is, uh, regardless of political affiliations or religious um, backgrounds, it is a major producer of technology and incubated uh, um, uh, companies and uh, on a worldwide basis, uh, but they have major threats. Uh, and, and cyber is, is a major issue for them. So it becomes a balance of what the specific needs are and also to overcome some of the, the paradigms. I gave a, a lecture a few years ago at the IT weekend in Kiev uh, about uh, uh, privacy and uh, cybersecurity and giving up personal data to the government for better security. I, which most people would probably not want to do easily, especially in an area that, that has the threats that, that you have. Uh, but if you use Google, if you use a GPS system, if you use uh, various type of public systems, you are giving up a lot of personal information already. The, uh, the important part of that is to become aware of what you're giving up and why and how it's being used and what key things need to be protected uh, that that you cannot give up for national security reasons uh, and what have you. So it's a it's a difficult question to answer because it is very specific to the environment that you are are running in. Uh, in the case uh, of uh, now in certain parts of Ukraine, I, I am one hundred percent sure because by the way, uh, cyber threats number one come from the the number one perpetrator of this regardless of any political aspects, is China. Number two is Russia. And number three is uh, certain areas in Africa, mainly Nigeria. Uh, and those are the, the, the three major, and there's levels of sophistication uh, in, in each. So the need in Ukraine to, uh, to have a very strong cyber uh, control system will be essential uh, because there will be uh, threats that are coming from from other other areas and be able to detect those threats and to protect uh, around it is, is going to be key. So uh, it's uh, it's a difficult question to answer uh, because it depends on on where you are. Uh, but in in your situation, uh, my opinion is it will be major. 
because we look at cyber threats. Yes, there are monetary threats where people are trying to scam someone to uh, to, to get to their bank accounts and to to uh, to get them to um, deal with uh, false companies and, and so forth. But then there are security threats of where you're providing information and even information about the movement of various government officials, the movement of, uh, of military or police vehicles, all of that in aggregation can be used in a negative way. So yes, having a large amount of information is critical, uh, but having too much of it um, and not having it well protected is, is even worse. The internet of things, there is also a, a joke of the internet of risky things, because very often we find that IT systems have a level of protection, antivirus, uh, intrusion detection, and so forth for systems. But a sensor device on a bridge somewhere that is uh, now uh, penetrated and feeding false information can also be used in a negative way to cause a uh, reaction from automated systems that are not valid. Um, floodgates, to cause floodgates to move uh, inappropriately and causing uh, damage and devastation as opposed to helping prevent it. Uh, so the the need for uh, technology and better technology to protect endpoint devices is another area uh, of, of growth that we will see. So the opportunity to use technology, but also to advance capabilities where there are limitations today uh, will also be essential. Stephen, and uh, last question here. Uh, and can you say, for example, that the society is not ready? And uh, here I'm talking about example of China, for example. So we have China and they have a lot of smart, smart solutions uh, in their society, but they're using, you probably heard about social scoring and how they use, for example, if you have low social score, you're not able to enter a train. <laughs> and uh, so do you think, for example, uh, when we, we start implementing smart city solutions and deeply integrated into our society, uh, that at some point, uh, this can be used internally, not external threat. This can be used against by authorities. Yes, absolutely. It can be used uh, in, in a negative way. And uh, the understanding of and the, the growth of concerns around ethics of how that data is used and how it's protected are, are going to be critical factors. And we will see more of that uh, as we, we move uh, forward, um, even in, in security cameras. So at one time, I'll give an example. I did uh, quite a bit of work with surveillance systems. Uh, and uh, surveillance systems, having cameras and understanding the, the movement of, of people and activities. I asked a, one of my team members on the, in the building that we were working in at that time, and this was our, our business, is I want to see if we can do a test and see if we can uh, grab those uh, video feeds and redirect them to somewhere else and then make uh, the security center have a false image. We were able to do this in one of our buildings in about 10 minutes. So we found that we were able to, to hack into those cameras to be able to provide a false feed and be able to take the real feed and, and use it in a different way. Now, we, we fixed this very quickly, uh, but that type of penetration and testing and challenging uh, is going to be critical. So there will be uh, continuing to have new challenges. As more information uh, is gathered about people and tracking, uh, like anything, it can be used in a, a malicious or it can be used in a criminal way, um, and, but it can also uh, help people. So it will be a balance. Uh, and we as, as providers of that data, uh, both directly through our cell phones and uh, through our, our interaction with technology, will also need to, to be able to have a better awareness uh, and, and how to, to stop it. So one of the, 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 while it's only legislation, but starts to open our eyes to that is the European standard of GDPR. So GDPR is one of the first and one of the most pervasive uh, views of how to deal with privacy uh, and the ability to be forgotten and the requirements of that. So we'll see more growth of that, but it is, is clearly a, a threat to us uh, as well that we need to, to handle uh, uh, properly. So there is not right now a good answer for it. And I think you will see more of that, especially as you uh, 
uh, hopefully in the very near future, are able to stop the physical threat, uh, I believe that the cyber threat will continue uh, to undermine uh, the, the country of Ukraine from your, your neighbors, uh, from Russia, and, and possibly from others in the, in the north and, and elsewhere uh, that you'll have to deal with for years to come. And that what they're and how they're infiltrating Ukraine. Uh, let's not be naive to the fact that the Chinese and others aren't watching closely on how to do that in in other countries uh, as well. So it becomes uh, awareness, I think, more than anything. What you're providing uh, and, and and trying to understand how, in fact, it can and will be used. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Uh, so I apologize, not a really clear answer because it is uh, an area of growth and we will be finding uh, new uh, concerns and threats. Uh, and uh, one of the mottos of when I was in IBM was staying ahead of the threat. So the threats are constantly changing, uh, is being able to recognize those, th those threats and stay ahead of them. But now, uh, moving in, in the interest of time, I'll try to wrap up in a couple minutes here, uh, is as we look at the maturity and growth of various types of intelligence systems is moving from, as I said earlier, to from connecting, connecting the pieces together to be able to instrument um, various assets, uh, humans, and being able to, to bring data together to a monitoring, now consolidating that, correlating that data, and being able to use it from an operations standpoint, and then being able to take uh, action on uh, when I find uh, issues or problems that I need to deal with uh, in a, an effective, creative way, to moving to uh, predictive analysis. The best thing that can happen, especially for infrastructure, is to predict a failure before it happens and be able to, to deal with that so I don't have unplanned outage time. Uh, and, and a major concern, and you've seen this, is, is infrastructure, the ability to move goods and people from place A to place B and have them, them operate is essential to all of our, our lives. And so being able to predict uh, failures in assets uh, based on historical data uh, and, and other factors of operations, of climate and so forth, uh, is an area where there is a tremendous amount of study. And then how do we optimize to be able to use less energy, uh, use less uh, natural resources uh, for recycling and so forth for uh, sustainability. Uh, if we move forward, I wanna give an example in the uh, company I'm with now is very focused uh, carrier corporation on intelligent buildings. So within cities, obviously we have uh, many buildings and within those buildings, uh, having the uh, the building itself being able to be created in a, uh, uh, a resilient and sustainable fashion is key. Uh, there is a, a center for intelligent buildings that uh, that we have in Florida. Uh, within this, uh, it is de designed as being one of the most sustainable and efficient buildings uh, in the world of trying to take advantage of climate control, uh, monitoring uh, devices, uh, for safety and security, for access of both physical and cyber, uh, and being able to use that as a as a model and as a testing ground for research uh, for some of these technologies. We find that there are a number of these in different parts of the world um, uh, to, to be able to uh, create these uh, structures and be able to uh, test out new technologies uh, and, and understanding the effect and how one, we can save money, we can be, make people's lives better uh, and have them operate uh, more efficient and effective than they were before. So this is an area creating new buildings uh, allows us to, to be able to take advantage of many things. And as uh, uh, Tural, as, as you had mentioned before, is it better to create from scratch? Uh, while it may not be what was desired, if you're put in a situation where now you have to create it, you can create with uh, modern technology that, that can be much more efficient than, than in the past. Even with the insulating factors, with climate control, uh, there's much more that can be done uh, with, with these newer structures uh, today. Um, in this particular example, we were able to uh, find that from the previous structure, uh, over 60% reduction in uh, energy usage to run the, the building in the same way, um, almost 40% uh, reduction in the use of uh, water, uh, uh, being able to, to deal with and how we save and be able to take advantage of outside 
uh, water that was being used uh, for, for the system itself and to reduce the overall um, uh, CO2 uh, that is produced from the operation of the structure. So some real uh, facts of what we've seen over the last few years in savings associated with this particular structure as one example of a, a smart building within a city. Uh, also, I want to mention, uh, okay. yeah, question? Uh, uh, yes, a small question. Going back to that building, smart building. So uh, comparing, for you can build this building uh, without smart those smart solutions. I'm curious, uh, how much of time does it take to pay back for that additional investment uh, that you have to pay upfront to build this smart city, a uh, smart building, on average? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a, a good question. Um, I for this building, I don't have those numbers, but I can I can get them uh, for you. But for other structures that I found is uh, we work on a one to three year basis in the business plan on being able to repay uh, what the additional cost would be. So, uh, and, and that goes into the next slide of whether or not I am buying things on prem or using. Uh, an operational cost, and I'll come to that in just a moment for how I finance uh, this. So uh, as we, we look at the, uh, the return on investment, the model is one to three years on, on the investment uh, to be able to, to return the additional cost in savings uh, within that period. So let's say uh, three years. Mm -hmm. but let me, because uh, some of that comes into this next page of what I was going to talk here, and hopefully I can answer your question uh, more. Uh, in previous types of infrastructure, I would build a building, all of the assets would be contained in that building, the IT infrastructure would be contained in that building, the power that would run it would have to, to be there. So everything would be resident, and I would have what would be called capital expenditures. So I expend a, uh, a certain amount of uh, money to, to build that and acquire that on on-prem mode. Now, as we are moving more to a shared environment and um, cloud-based infrastructure where I can pay based on a uh, uh, operational expense, there are new consumption models that are coming up that need to be taken uh, account for. Uh, uh, one of the things that I had to, to deal with in smarter cities, um, uh, and I'll give an example, let me take a step back from this chart. Uh, IBM, we had some of the best, most robust uh, solutions that, uh, that provided uh, uh, amazing capabilities, but the problem was they were unaffordable. And uh, the only uh, cities that we were able to use them in are the very large cities like New York, London, uh, LA, uh, Beijing, you know, the, the cities that are massive and have a, a, a large budget. So how do we then get to 2,000, 5,000, 20,000 smaller uh, cities and be able to provide some of these uh, these solutions for buildings, uh, as well as for the cities them, themselves. So there are additional uh, consumption models that I worked on. And this is where in, in the class work uh, that we uh, provide at uh, the V Business School is to, to look at the, uh, the consumption models and the business around it. So for example, uh, I worked with a, a group in Canada, a telecommunications company, where we're able to provide these smart city solutions almost as a utility through the telco. So the telco can provide them as additional services. You already have the connectivity through cellular communication, and you're able to then take advantage of the, uh, the solutions at a low cost of entry, uh, because now you're just, it's a shared environment and you're working off of a cloud solution that is being provided by the telco. So it's a different business model and allowed us, uh, we identified 200 cities in Canada that we were able to get to and be able to provide these solutions in less time than the, uh, uh, the, the time it takes to, uh, to have the arrangement with a, a New York or LA or London or, or Rome or, or a city like, like that. So in the time it takes to return investment, now we are moving to some consumption models which have a much lower initial cost. Now, over time, the, the, the payments may be more because I'm paying continuously on a subscription basis. So there's, there's a balance of high upfront cost and then uh, depreciating over time 
Uh, and then also you need to, to think about how you would need to recreate or, or uh, put in new um, IT uh, servers and so forth. So that cost goes up and, and is more um, cyclical, uh, cyclical based as opposed to a, an operational model which allows you now to start with a lower cost of entry and moving uh, over time that you're, you're paying. So the, the payback is much shorter because I need less capital and less funding to take advantage of these solutions upfront. So we're trying to reduce that time to value uh, and allow uh, you to get uh, a faster time to value and take advantage of these solutions that are now being put in a shared economy through uh, through uh, cloud providers, through regional providers, possibly through, let's say, I'll take an example of Lviv then providing uh, the, the solutions. It has the main hosting, but then charging uh, for use of uh, various types of systems for city management, for water operations, for energy uh, consumption to maybe some of the smaller towns around it. So these different consumption models uh, are, are being looked at, at in combination with the technology on how you consume that technology. So I think I, think I gave you a, a long answer. I'm not sure if I answered your question. It definitely answers, but we also have a few questions uh, in okay, the comments. Please. So I will just read them. Uh, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure if I correctly understood the question. So the, the, uh, the first question, introducing horizontal service uh, services sets high requirements on interoperability. Who should drive the transformation for it? And then there is additional question uh, also from Alexei, how we can then handle risks from appearance of these new natural monopolies, both in means of economic and cybersecurity. Okay, I'm not sure I fully understood the, the, the question. Uh, if it, if Let me try to uh, see if I can interpret that. As we create these, these horizontal solutions, uh, which may, uh, let me take for example, uh, energy uh, distribution and the uh, the cost of energy distribution, how it's being used, there may be specific needs uh, in, in various areas. So there becomes a common layer of the similar needs that are needed across the board. One of the, with cybersecurity, one of the advantages you have, there's an advantage in that uh, some of these large providers uh, have a also a very large budget and are constantly looking at one, how to prevent threats from entering. So they have uh, significant uh, firewalls and access uh, around these, uh, these systems, both physical and um, logical that a, a small city may not be able to afford to do. And that cost is shared amongst a large number. Uh, and they have that, that level of expertise. That isn't a, a final answer. Uh, because right, there's always a potential of infiltrating, uh, but the the fact that they can acquire and and attract attract and acquire uh, talent and be able to take advantage of uh, resources that would not be attainable by a small entity is where I see the advantage uh, there in those those horizontal solutions. Uh, whereas if I'm creating smaller vertical solutions for uh, multiple cities. Uh, each one of them would have to have that level of expertise and that, that threat analysis from a, a cyber perspective being done individually. So that economy. Now, it's important that the provider is a trusted source uh, and, and that is almost a psychological as well as a commercial threat that, you know, do you trust Google with your information? Do you trust Amazon um, uh, and AWS uh, with being able to to handle uh, your uh, your information in your background. Those are things that we will need to uh, to think about uh, more. Uh, but their trust and their integrity is part of their business model. As soon as they are not trusted or there is an uh, a uh, an exposure, uh, they will uh, they they can potentially go out of business. But but that is something that we do need to consider on who we trust. Uh, and being able to take advantage of that economy of scale. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so I think, I, I hope we answered the question, Alexi, uh, and I guess we need to move forward with the next slides. 
Okay, so I'm just wrapping up. I know we're at the end of our, our time here. Coming, as I talked uh, about intelligence and, and using now the becoming whole aspect of uh, using more historical information, the whole aspect of using to historical and information uh, to uh, move into to uh, something build, that is uh, uh, into uh, uh, something uh, predictive that is, nature. So uh, being able to uh, use history and nature. being able to so then being able to use and deal history with and being the able to then type of uh, predict and knowing a threat from the past and being able to stop it knowing. Going a forward threat from the past, and then and using that historical information to understand forward, how and then that using that historical information to understand as well how that is may be the used whole cognitive against stage. us. And that goes uh, as back well into oh, is the whole cognitive stage, and that goes back into into what uh, Pharrell, what you had mentioned earlier, is uh, ensuring that we are, are are doing things that are in fact um, not going to to compromise our own integrity. Apologize. Uh, moving forward. So moving forward, um, one of the key things I'll leave you with is the importance to move uh, and look at and focus on mission and focus on the the consumer needs and then how the technology it can be applied to it. Uh, very often, as myself as an engineer and as data scientists and others, uh, we can fall into the trap of having technology and then trying to determine the solution uh, that it provides. So looking for a problem to solve, which can, uh, it's not impossible to do that, but is it not as effective as understanding the user problems, understanding the needs, uh, and then being able to apply the technology uh, to help those needs. So uh, sensors uh, will be human sensors, as well as individual uh, sensors on various types of assets. Uh, it will be the critical infrastructure, but then being able to manage and sift out real data as opposed to uh, false alarms, false alerts, uh, and being able to find the insights within is the, the, the key to the smarter cities. So, uh, and I'll end on the, the three main areas of moving to that cognitive uh, sense of the engagement, uh, interacting and assisting through the understanding, what are the key problems and key objectives? What is the journey that you need to take from reconstruction in some cases to creating uh, sustainable buildings to bringing in the uh, the essential resources to sustain human life as well as to sustain commerce and uh, the economic engine uh, to be able to make uh, decisions uh, and moving to uh, as much as possible bias free which is very complicated we could spend a few hours talking on on that uh, and and trying to become as much as it makes sense, semi-autonomous, uh, and being able to uh, to allow certain things that should happen normally, uh, being able to regulate the amount of uh, resources that are needed at various times of the day and uh, week and year, uh, that can be uh, uh, managed and autonomously uh, dealt with, and then to be to be able to discover new insights. Uh, where I can become more efficient. And wrapped around all of this is uh, the cyber and the protection to be able to ensure that these systems can operate in a way that benefits individuals, benefits society, benefits uh, the various businesses without being compromised uh, by external uh, threats, whether they be government or individual uh, is trying to, uh, to steal uh, assets, to be able to destroy assets, uh, to be able to uh, to infiltrate uh, your business uh, that wraps around it. So uh, I, I thank you for your attention. Uh, very high level. I apologize that we're not able to uh, get into a lot of the depth of detail because it is a very broad topic. I am happy to uh, drill into specific areas uh, in more detail uh, and uh, in additional uh, webinars like this. But for now, uh, let me stop and see if there are other additional questions that I can answer uh, and be respectful to you, uh, to your time uh, as well. Uh, thank you. We actually have one question. I think it's perfect with this slide. And okay, now we have two questions. So uh, the first one, um, what are the top uh, five uh, key technology constraints uh, that we currently have and that uh, keep cities from becoming smart over the globe today? Okay. Uh, one of the main ones is interconnectivity uh, of devices. So the movement to 5G has been slow uh, and the effects uh, with it. 
Uh, so being able to be interconnected uh, to the level that is needed has slowed things. Two is the, the financing and really doesn't have a technology uh, as much as the consumption model of what the cost is associated with providing smart city solutions. And that's why the business model <laughs> and the consumption, uh, the ways that we consume it with potentially cloud or hybrid, where I have partial cloud and um, uh, uh, and then also on-prem uh, uh, is what I find to be uh, the second uh, biggest uh, impasse. And then the third is really uh, uh, the, the fear of what can be done and then how that may be compromised by providing too much information, which you brought up uh, before. I'll give an example of that. Uh, some of you may remember a few years ago, the uh, in Boston there was a uh, terrorist attack with the, uh, during the marathon. Uh, at which time, uh, the way that that was solved was with uh, video that came from private entities, mainly from uh, people's cell phones, from banks, and and so forth. And I have a lot of background on the uh, uh, the investigation. But after that, a few weeks later one of the cities in the Boston area decided for privacy reasons to turn off all of their, uh, their city uh, surveillance cameras. So if you think about that, uh, well, that was used and instrumental to find these terrorists, yet uh, people were so concerned and fearful that their, uh, their lives are being uh, watched that they turned off those, uh, those cameras. So what is that balance uh, and we see this in China, right? China, very bluntly, uses uh, surveillance cameras and they, they use it uh, for uh, for monitoring and surveilling people. Uh, so it can have an effect of uh, being able to solve crimes quickly, uh, but if it's not used properly, it can also be used in a, uh, in a malicious way. So that, that fear. So one of them being uh, the inhibitors of getting technology fast enough to uh, the cost and the business models of how I can consume it more easily, and three, the fear of the unknown. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, because we have to wrap up this event, we have one last question, uh, and I think it, it, it's also good uh, to wrap it up. It's about the future. When do you think uh, there will be a moment when uh, smart cities will develop to the moment that there will be no need in human managing this system, so it will be fully autonomous? Uh, I don't think we'll ever get to it being fully autonomous uh, because uh, it's too easy to uh, uh, us as humans. Uh, we we I, I don't think we will get there in our lifetimes of any of us. Uh, but will we get closer to it? Uh, what I've seen is uh, we came out with and I was working on smarter city solutions before cities knew how to deal with them. Uh, and like the concept, but honestly, very few, if any, were being implemented. That's why so many the companies that were providing this technology uh, went out of business. Um, but now we are at the moment where they are being used effectively and we are seeing uh, the value in specific areas. So uh, my advice has been to pick the areas that we uh, can see uh, sustained value and be able to implement those solutions and how we uh, automate them. So there is some uh, automation that's done. So individual people can now monitor much broader areas uh, and, and make decisions where it would require many uh, people before. Um, but getting to fully autonomous without uh, human interaction, uh, I, I think uh, we, we will not get there anytime uh, soon. Uh, and it's questionable whether we should but being able to, uh, to provide information that allows humans to make faster, more intelligent decisions uh, is, is really the, the main focus. Thank you, Simon. Thinking about, thinking about Skynet, I think we don't need it, but anyways, maybe in some uh, far future that will happen. Uh, thank you a lot for this presentation and sharing all your knowledge and experience. And also thanks to everyone who asked uh, questions. Uh, hopefully we were able to answer all of them and yeah, you're looking into the future and to try out to implement those smart city solutions, uh, soon enough in Ukrainian cities. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to, to dealing with some of you in the future as we uh, move to the, the rebuilding stages. Thank you. Thank you, Sian.
Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Cyril, for this uh, informative and really fascinating discussion. And uh, uh, have a great time and uh, see you later. And for those who joined us today, thank you very much for attending our webinar. You can watch it again or share it with your friends, colleagues later when, it, when we will post it on YouTube and on our social media. So follow us uh, and don't miss our other events. And also uh, just kindly remind you if you want to see, see once again or to uh, our admission to the master program in technology management is still open. So find more details on our website. Uh, have a good night and see you again. Bye.